All right, let's spend some time talking about KVP, particularly the way that our textbook presents it. So I will be referring to the textbook quite a bit in the course of the lecture. I'm going to go ahead and get it out and open it up to the right chapter. Okay, so here are my learning objectives for this discussion. Um, we want to describe how KVP controls the penetration of the x-ray beam. And it's going to be helpful if you've got some of the same metaphors that we used last week in talking about mass. We're going to use, we're going to kind of continue those metaphors today. Um, we'll talk about why this is considered the technical factor for control of remnant beam contrast. Um, that's the way that I'm going to talk about um, kind of subject contrast. He talks about the subject contrast of the remnant beam. So I'll, we'll unpack what that means. Um, given various values, we're going to apply the 15% rule um, to technique changes, so we'll work out some of the math problems that are in the textbook and we'll explain relationships between KVP and scatter production, which is a limiting factor to just kind of endlessly increasing KVP. And then we'll also talk about image factors that KVP does not influence, right? So um, it's helpful to go back to that metaphor of the, the water hose, right, and thinking about, so we said that mass controls current, which is like the flow of the water through the water hose system. Um, KVP is a control of pressure then. So it's like the power that's moving through the system. So if you can imagine as, um, as I increase uh, certain resistance, I'm increasing the amount of pressure um, that might come out through the system, okay, or decreasing the the pressure, what have you. Um, so that metaphor is very, very helpful. But we're going to talk about kilovoltage as a measure of electric force or pressure. And the way that kilovoltage is controlled within the x-ray circuit is at the auto transformer. We actually change the number of windings that we're accessing at the auto transformer. And this results in different potential differences across the x-ray tube. Right? So as we turn up the KVP, we're increasing the potential difference across the x-ray tube, and it's increasing the power that's drawing the electrons across that gap to produce x-rays. And one way to think about that is static electricity. Um, this is not so much a case here um, in these more humid parts of the country, but when I lived out west, especially in the wintertime, you could get knocked across the room by a static electric charge, right? Um, so, and the way to do it was to have a lot of shag carpet or something in your house or, or be, you know, rubbing your belly when you go to touch the uh, uh, metal doorknob, right? And if you notice the way that static electricity works is, so we build up a static charge inside the system. So we're building up electrons. We're creating a potential difference in our bodies, right? Because our bodies are capacitors. They can store electrons. So we're producing a potential difference because we're adding more and more electrons to the body, right? And then when we reach out to touch the doorknob, we discharge that potential difference, right? And what's interesting is the amount of the static electric pop is directly related to how close your finger is to the doorknob when it pops. The closer it is, the louder the pop will be, right? Um, so it, it operates on something like the inverse square law. Um, but that potential difference is important. And the greater potential difference that's between like a higher KVP um, setting versus a lower KVP setting, the more that we turn up that potential difference, the more we are turning up the penetrability of the x-ray beam. We are increasing how much power we're giving to the x-rays, right? And so since though when we're talking about kilovoltage, um, we measure it as a peak kilovoltage that's reached and everything below that is basically an average energy. We talk about it as KVP. So sometimes this will be, a kilovoltage will be abbreviated KEV, kilo electron volts, or KV, kilovoltage. When we're talking about it as a technique, we're talking about a kilovoltage peak. What is the peak energy? And then there's a number of average energies that would fall beneath that peak. Um, so increasing the KVP increases the average beam energy. It increases the average penetrability of the x-ray beam. Um, and that's discussed pretty much pages uh, 249 through two, 251 in our textbook. Now, going back to what we talked about with mass, right? It's helpful to load up those shotgun shells again, right? 
Um, because what we said with mass, if we're going to work with the shotgun shell analogy, is mass is the number of shot that are in the shotgun shell. Right? So if we have a high mass, we have a whole lot of shot in the shotgun shell. Um, KVP is more like the caliber or the gauge of the shotgun shell. So as we increase the amount of gunpowder that we put into the shotgun shell, we're increasing the ability for that shot to penetrate through different bodies. Like for example, here's an x-ray of a man who was shot with a shotgun, right, um, with a very low caliber. So what he has now is a whole lot of shot stuck inside of his body, right? So the same thing happens with the x-ray. So if we think about KVP controlling the penetrability of the x-ray beam, it, what it's doing is it's saying the, it's controlling the percentage of x-ray photons that are capable of passing through the patient's body and darkening the image receptor. It's, it's controlling the power that we're placing inside the x-ray photons to pass through matter, right? So if this man had been shot with a more high-powered shotgun, more of this buckshot would have passed through his body, right? Same as what's happening when we control KVP in the x-ray circuit. The best measure of this, and I'm not going to, this is a whole big sticky wicket, but the best measure of this penetrability power is half value layer. We will unpack that in the summer, and then we'll return to it in radiation biology, but just file that away in the back of your mind that what half value may, layer is measuring is the power that allows the x-rays to penetrate through some kind of stopping material. And that's going to be the most accurate way that we can measure the penetrability of the x-ray beam. So, but KVP settings give us at least par a, partial, um, a partial explanation of what's, of what's occurring, right? So what we need is a KVP that provides at least partial penetration of the anatomy of interest. If we don't have enough KVP, we will not have a pow enough power to get through the body. So then we wind up with just the buckshot in the body, right? We need enough power behind this to get at least some of that buckshot through the body. Some of it needs to get stopped and some of it needs to go through. That's how we get a picture, right? Um, so the way that we think about that, the ter one term that we apply to that is quality. So we talk about mass representing the quantity, the number of buckshot that we're putting in there. That's the quantity. We talk about KVP measuring the quality. What kind of energy, what kind of penetrability does the average x-ray in this beam have? And we're talking about trillions of x-rays being produced. Now this is going to be a primary controlling factor for contrast, right? And generally, the rule of thumb in thinking about KVP is to think about it as the primary control of contrast. That was particularly true with, with film systems. It's not so much the case with digital systems, and we'll talk about why that is here. So no amount of mass can compensate for insufficient KVP. I cannot put enough buckshot in my shotgun shell that, to not compensate for not having enough gunpowder in that shotgun shell. Right? So I need enough KVP to shoot this stuff through the patient's body. If I don't have enough KVP, I'm not going to get an x-ray. So no amount of mass will compensate for insufficient KVP. Um, but what's interesting is KVP is inversely related to subject contrast in the remnant beam. It's inversely related to subject contrast. That means that as I increase my KVP, as I increase my KVP, contrast decreases. You can think about that as grayscale lengthens, right? But the reason it happens is because there's an increased percentage of photons that are passing through the patient's body. Okay? This is a big, 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 big point. Put stars and everything around this part of your textbook because it's, it's something that I even struggle with to this day. If someone asks me a question about this, I'll have to stop and check and re rethink. How does it work? Okay, that's right. As I, as I increase my KVP, my contrast is dropping, right? As KVP decreases, contrast increases. So the grayscale shortens because a decreased percentage of the photons are able to penetrate through the anatomy of interest. Now, I've given us an illustration here of what high contrast and low contrast look like. This is a picture of a bus in the snow. Um, 
And what you can see is this image on the far left is a high contrast image. So the blacks are very black, so the white are very white. There's not a lot of gray shades between them, right? And so we're saying that that has a short gray scale and we can actually plot that along the slope of this line from here to here. That is the amount of contrast is tied to the slope of that line. As that line increases in its steepness, the contrast increases as well. Um, and it becomes higher and higher contrast. Conversely, if we have a low slope here, we have a much wider window here, and so we have more shades of gray. So we have a lengthening of the gray scale and a decreasing of contrast. So if I were to think about which is which here in the world of KVP, right, the bus on the left, is it taken with a high KVP or a low KVP? The bus on the left. It's correct. This is the low KVP setting. You can see where I can get confused on this really easy. Versus over here, this is the high KVP setting. Okay? That is a big, big point. All right. I'm going to change gears now. We're going to talk about the 15% rule. <clears throat> KVP influences... Yes? Can I ask you a favor? This is another... This is a big, big point. Here's where stuff gets really muddy again. KVP doesn't just control quality, it also controls quantity. So as we increase the potential difference across the x-ray tube, guess what? We're sucking more electrons across the x-ray tube, so we're also increasing the quantity of x-rays that are being produced. So mass just controls quantity. KVP controls both quality and quantity. We're going to say it's primarily, in terms of the world of technique, it is the primary way that we control quality, but it also does control quantity, at least the amount that passes through the patient, right? So since KVP influences both x-ray tube output and penetrability, we have to do some recalculations here. And the way that we do that, the simple way that we do it, and he talks about some of the more bogged down ways of doing it, but the 15% rule is pretty much gospel, right? The registry tests based on it, and it has become a universal rule of how do you make changes with the KVP without affecting the exposure at the image receptor, right, adversely. So anytime we change the KVP by 15%, that is equal to changing the exposure by a factor of two. That means that KVP is a very powerful changer of exposure because a 15% change in KVP doubles exposure. A tiny, tiny change in KVP doubles exposure, right? A tiny, tiny turning down of KVP cuts the exposure in half, right? So the way that we talk about that is the 15% rule and the way that this is generally framed, there's a number of different ways to, to place this rule, but he gives it in the oldest form right here, which is to main exposure, to maintain exposure at the IR, for every 15% change in KVP, adjust the mass by a factor of two. I think that's the most concise way to express it. Um, so, if you want a nitty gritty quick way in your brain to find 15%, take 10% of the number, right? So 10% of 40, is 4, divide 4 in half, that gives me 2, add those together, it gives me 6. That gives me 6 is 15% of 40, right? Um, so that's just one example of maybe a quick and dirty way to do it. Um, we will do some math problems though now, okay, so that we're all clear on this. Okay, let's talk about scatter. So you, you might wonder, okay, well you just reduced the patient's exposure to roughly a quarter of what their initial exposure was in terms of mass. Like in essence, by increasing the KVP, I reduced patient dose, right? Because we said that mass is tied to patient dose. So it seems like increasing KVP is a great idea, and it is, it's a good idea. The KVPs that y'all are memorizing are different than the ones that I memorized when I was in school, because digital changed things. 
But one thing that digital has not changed is scatter production, right? So what we find, if we go back in our textbook to um, chapter 12, like on page 203, you will see that as we increase KVP, um, photoelectric interactions decrease as a percentage of the remnant beam, and Compton effect remains stable, so the overall percentage of the remnant beam is now scattered. As I increase my KVP, I am increasing the amount of scatter that's present in the remnant beam. I'm increasing noise. And I like that figure 12-5 uh, on page 203 for showing graphically um, what that looks like. Now, digital systems compensate for this increase, right? Digital systems are able to manipulate the image and apply filters and get rid of some of that contrast or get rid of some of that scatter. So the final say where we're at state of the art right now is to increase KVP when at all possible in order to provide adequate exposure at the IR while minimizing patient dose, knowing that we can't go too high with this thing. We have kind of a ceiling that we can hit beyond which it's all noise, but we will increase it as much as we can. So while maintaining the exposure of the IR, increasing KVP decreases patient dose. It is counterintuitive, but I'm going to say it again. And there's going to be some of us who don't get this while I'm saying it, and that's fine. I did not get it the first time a teacher told me. Increasing KVP decreases patient dose. Increasing your KVP decreases patient dose. As I lower my KVP, I am increasing my patient dose. Right? And you can kind of see that if we work this problem out in the opposite direction, if I start lowering my KVP, what's happening to my mass to compensate? Yep. So you add more dose shot. to the patient. Yep, you're adding more shot to the shotgun shell possibly causing that much more destruction to the body. Does that make sense? Good. That's a big point. Okay, finally, what doesn't KVP do? Because what I've pretty much told you is KVP almost does everything, right? KVP does a lot of stuff. It controls scatter, it controls quality, it controls quantity, it controls pretty much technique is KVP. In fact, the way that your Merrill's list technique is based on KVP, right? What it doesn't do is any of the geomet geometrical stuff. KVP has no bearing on sharpness of detail or unsharpness. Conversely, it has no bearing on shape distortion or magnification. It has no bearing on size distortion. It does not affect geometrical qualities of the image. Pretty much everything it's got a handout. Everything else, though, it's got a handout. Okay? Thank y'all.